Yeah, I definitely wanted to rebel. I was getting myself into trouble at home and trouble with the law. And I'll never forget that. That really was this, the beginning of my journey back. I grew up in a small town in Ontario called Coldwater. So growing up in a small town, there wasn't a lot to do except there's a local ski hill and an ice rink. And I, I could basically choose what I wanted to do, so I chose skiing. So I've been skiing ever since I was could walk, basically. So I took lessons uh, at the local ski hill, and then I also even started to work there, just working with the little kids and helping them uh, learn how to ski. And my buddy and I were trying to always sneak into the, the terrain parks. Back in the day when skiers weren't allowed in the terrain parks, it was a snowboard only. So for a skier to want to get into the terrain park, that was, uh, we had a lot of barriers to cross. So it took a couple of years to, to earn the respect uh, of the snowboarders there. Uh, I don't know if they ever fully did, but I think they did. Growing up as a kid, going to public school, and, and uh, I was known uh, and associated with Christianity, I definitely wanted to almost get away from that. That's basically where things started to get challenging for me. I was getting myself into uh, trouble at home and trouble with the law. Yeah, what made me hit rock bottom was one night uh, driving recklessly. We got pulled over and charged and thrown into jail that night um, for dangerous driving. And it was a criminal offense at the time. That really stopped me in my tracks. I had made a lot of stupid decisions up to that point, but I knew that this was going to affect my life for the next year at least, not being able to drive, being more close to home and have to rely on others. So at that time, uh, where I had to depend on a lot of people to, to take me places and, and people from church really rallied around me and they really showed true concern for me and prayed for me, and I'll never forget that. That really was this, the beginning of um, my journey back to the Lord. And it was a, just a way of, for God to get a hold of my life and just be still and be quiet and a, a chance for me to get my life right with the Lord. And He really did use that time to show me Himself and to show me that He was really there all along. And I decided to give my life back to Christ at the age of 19. After I came back to Christ, my testimony was kind of radical and was uh, I was asked to share it in front of youth groups and, and stuff. I, I got involved in youth ministry and had a small group of guys that I was mentoring and, and, and leading in that way. So I decided to join the two things that I loved, which was working with youth and skiing and start something called Righteous Riders, which would be a ski group where I would be able to coach kids how to ski um, in the park but also just to kind of journey with them so they would have someone older to look up to. I think I even had a little bit of pressure that I had to serve the Lord uh, doing this mission, but He really isn't interested in what we're doing for Him. He just wants ourselves. And when we give Him ourselves, He'll do something with that. And I really felt like Jesus came after me and He pursued me and He won and I surrendered my life. And life now is... There's so much more hope, and I really realize that now. We're going to enter into some musical worship time, so feel free to join us, however you feel like worshiping this morning. past the stars and there's an answer to every question mark and there's a name and there's a hope flowing through these veins and there's a voice that echoes through the pain 
And there's an amber ready for a flame. And there's a name. And we will fix our eyes. And we will fix our eyes on the one who overcame.
is joy here this morning. And I love this next song because it just talks about how it's okay to, um, to misstep. It's okay to crumble. It's okay to be lost. Because God meets us there. God finds us there. And he always draws us back. And he always has so much grace. it shattered. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Found her blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still Somebody you still want, but somehow you love me as you find me. Who am I to think your glory needs my praises? But if this borrowed breath is yours, Lord, take it all. You are faithful and you are gracious and I'm just grateful. You think you don't need a single thing and still you want my this kind of love but somehow this kind of love is who you are it's a grace I could never write up to be somebody you still want but somehow you love me as you find me
won't second guess Cause I need your love more than anything well, I'm in, I'm yours Your love's too good to leave me
Amazing. Boy, I love starting our time together with worship, and especially worship that includes a saxophone. I hope uh, that was meaningful for you as well. Hey, my name is Mark. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. It is so good to be together today. Really, really good. I was away last week, if you've been hanging out here for a little while, and Carmen was in my place. I just want to say thanks to Carmen. And I know she put a challenge out there to discuss on the chat about, uh, you know, which uh, which host you prefer. But I don't think you need to do that this morning. I, uh, I know Carmen would come out on top. She would be the winner in that circumstance any day. So thanks, Carmen, for stepping in uh, while I was away. It was nice to be away, but it is so good to be back uh, with you all. And today we are um, in our third episode, as Danielle has been saying, of our series in Colossian, um, Colossians, looking at uh, eyes, hearts, and minds. And Quincy's going to be with us this morning teaching, as well as uh, including some of those artistic expressions that we've been doing all along in this series. It's been so awesome to be able to experience um, and integrate some of these artists and some of the ways that God is revealing himself to them through this series and through the book of Colossians. Um, by no means am I an artist. In fact, if I were to express myself through an artistic impression, it might uh, push people away from God rather than draw them into him like some of these that we've been doing. But I love being able to experience and observe and um, participate in what God is doing through others and through the gifts and abilities and talents that he's given others through this, these different ways of expressing themselves, the ways that they are experiencing God. And so I'm glad we get to uh, continue that journey this morning as well. Uh, a few other exciting things happening uh, today. First of all, we have all 13 of our parishes, sorry, I should just say we have 13 parishes <laughs> gathering this morning, which is so exciting. If you are interested uh, in gathering in person, in diving into that, in looking if, uh, into that, if you are in the GTA, feel free to go to themeetinghouse.com slash locations to get more information about whether the parish nearest you or your parish is gathering and what that looks like for them. Now, something else that's happening today, at least here in Ontario, we're in the GTA just outside of Ontario, and this weekend is something that we call Family Day Weekend. It's a holiday, it's a long weekend for us here in Ontario, and it's, it's designed so that we can spend extra time with our family, and I love that idea. I think that's so fun. I mean, who of us doesn't love an extra day off or a long weekend anyways? Um, but I realize that celebrating family can be a tricky thing. I mean, our experiences of family look so different. The truth is, they can be good, they can be bad, they can be ugly, right? For some of us, thinking about family is a painful or a hard thing. Uh, for some of us, it's just sad because we've experienced loss. For others, we're in a really great place for family, and so that's a really good thing. And so I just want to say, wherever you are kind of in that family experience, the one thing that I can say is that you are family here, and that is why... Uh, I love this place. It's one of the many, many reasons why the Meeting House means so much to me. Uh, and I thought I would give you a little bit uh, in, uh, in a, an inside scoop into what my family experience looks like, both personally as well as here at the Meeting House. I've got some pictures for us here. Um, this is, yes, this is Carola and me uh, this past summer and our puppy Murphy. Murphy is both the best and the worst. Uh, it's amazing how he can be that. He's a very cute uh, little puppy that keeps us on our toes. They'll question 
And so this is my uh, nuclear family. This is the family that I go home to, that I spend the most time with, that is um, meaningful to me. But there are other ways that I experience family in my life as well. The past two years, family has looked uh, like this quite a bit. If we go to this next page, it's been on a screen where we've been on Zoom. I think we're celebrating a birthday here. I'm not even sure what we're doing, but it's friends coming together uh, to still acknowledge, to still be intentional because families are intentional. Uh, together. They spend time, they go out of their way to, to acknowledge special occasions and meaningful times together. And so that has been a big part of my experience here at the Meeting House. And then if we go to this next picture, this last picture, this was pre-pandemic a few years ago, uh, but I thought it was a beautiful picture of what uh, a home church family could look like. This was... Um, this was our home church a few years ago in Ottawa, and it was this beautiful expression of coming together and sharing a meal together. Um, so often family time revolves around food, and I think that's so important. And whether it's our nuclear family or our chosen family uh, of our home church, uh, food can play such an important role in that. And so these are just a few of the examples of what family can look like for us here at the Meeting House. And so whether, you're, whether your personal family experience is a really great one or a really hard one or somewhere in between, I just want to let you know that here at The Meeting House, there are many different opportunities to join family. You know, we read uh, in scripture that we are all a part of God's household, right? That Jesus brings us together. He breaks down those barriers. And so when we come together, we are family together. And so I just want to invite you into this family. If you are looking for a family, this is, um, this is the best place to be. Really, really, it is. All right, well, thank you for letting me chat about family. This is something that I've been excited to share with you. So glad that I can uh, give you a little peek into what my world looks like, uh, both here at the Meeting House as well as at home. Hey, I want to continue our time together uh, with just a little bit of an update around our giving experience. So um, we're about halfway through our fiscal year. Our fiscal year starts in uh, July, and so thought it would be a good time for an update. Our director of finance has put a detailed update in the About Us section on the website. So if you go to themeetinghouse.com slash about dash us, you can get all of those details there. Um, it's got a lot of information for you there. But if you're like me and you're like, okay, Mark, just give me the Coles notes. I'm probably not going to go to that website. Well, here's a little bit of information for you. This year, our donations are currently uh, in our general fund are sitting about 5% below where we were relative to last year. So we're a little bit down. Now we have a strong belief in a policy here that we don't spend money that we don't have. And so being down a little bit meant that, has meant that we've needed to adjust our spending and adjust our budgets and how we do ministry and what that looks like. Now we, uh, by all means, are hopeful and we're praying that uh, giving will pick up again. And so we can continue uh, the vision and um, living out the vision that we feel Jesus has called us to, uh, to introduce spiritually curious people to the Jesus-centered life. But I do, I do also want to invite you into that, into that um, hope and praying for this. Will you pray with us, for us, uh, around these financial uh, needs that we're experiencing? And if you feel so called, perhaps, perhaps this is a space that you join regularly. Perhaps this is your church family and a place that you call home. Uh, but you haven't yet taken that step to give, uh, would you prayerfully consider going to themeetinghouse.com slash give to find more information about giving, about what that means uh, here at The Meeting House? Because we recognize that none of this ministry could happen without that incredible generosity. Okay, hey, I'm going to pray as we continue our morning together, uh, and then we're going to dive into the teaching. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your incredible love for us. Thank you that you bring us together as family. That no matter what our background is, no matter uh, where we've come from, we have a place where we can go home. A place where we can be together, where we can share a meal together, where we can be vulnerable with each other, laugh together. Lord, we, uh, we lift up uh, these financial updates and these concerns and these realities that we're experiencing, and we just pray, Jesus, uh, we know that you are our ultimate provider, and we ask for your provision. 
we lift up the rest of this service to you, Jesus, and we ask uh, that we could experience you, that we could see you in new ways today. In your name I pray. And as we head into uh, the teaching now, I just want to uh, welcome Jen, who's going to be doing a dance for us. And as I said at the beginning, um, we have the ability to experience and to uh, take in what some of these artists um, are doing and how they're experiencing Jesus and God. And so this is a dance that Jen created um, in an expression of praise and worship. And so I would encourage you, uh, let this dance take you into that praise and worship. Or if your mind is too busy, perhaps ask yourself the question, uh, what is God saying to me through this dance? Let's go there now.
Jen, so much. It's such a gift to be able to experience different expressions of worship in a way that we're, we're made with our whole bodies. We have five senses. We have an opportunity to, to praise God with everything. And I'm reminded of that, that passage in uh, Psalm, the last Psalm 150, where David is just going through all of the different instruments. Praise God with the cymbals and the tambourine. And the, he just keeps going down the list. And to praise God with dancing. And, and I love that we've been able to do this for the last uh, few weeks, so just being able to, to experiment and even be surprised by the way that God can show up in these different expressions of worship. Uh, it's it's um, something I've been thinking about, is that there's, there's t- far too few places where we're allowed to, to mourn and to dance. Not including weddings and funerals, but I, I think we need more opportunities for for places where we can actually mourn and we can dance and celebrate. So, uh, Jen, without getting into, you know, the the interpretation of what you've done, can you maybe share with us a little bit of your creative process leading up to what you've just shared with us? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks so much, Quincy. So, as you know, we're in a story of Colossians right now. And for me, Colossians really stands out just the supremacy of Christ and the invitation to focus on Christ. And so when it was first launched, this idea that I would dance as part of the Colossians series, I searched all kinds of songs and came to the song, Be Thou My Vision, as really well describing the focus on Jesus. And that's why I chose the song. And the recording team, our music team, recorded that beautiful music that you just heard. Rachel sang that beautiful lyric that I danced to. And that was the original intent. But as we recorded it, and as I marinate in the song to create these movements and to literally have the music be in every fiber of my being, what really stood out to me was joy. And I honestly got scared for all of us because I was afraid, because in this moment right now when I dance, I want to be 100% in the moment with Jesus, like present with Jesus. And my mind for the last two weeks has been a bit struggling that Dear Jesus, um, we were gonna like focus on you, but like joy, like uh, don't you know what's going on in our church, in our country, in our globe? Like this is a tough time, and is joy the right message? And then what he showed me through this dance, and I didn't, you know, when you know a song and you love a song for years and years and years, you don't necessarily hear every word, but when you marinate in it and dance it out, you realize this song speaks to the intimacy with Jesus. Like, he's our great father, we're his child. We are in him, he's in us. And that is like an amazing mystery, a beautiful union that words just can't really quite even express, which is why I'm sort of happy to even try to give it more than words with dance. But in that intimacy, we find out that there's joy, that Jesus himself, his personhood, is joy and love and hope and peace, but even joy. And so bravely here, I've celebrated, even like a little girl twirling my skirt, just really being able to celebrate that Jesus is that good, he's that wonderful, he's that loving, that we can even have joy in him, even in the times that we're in. So I hope that that's been meaningful to your souls, and thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much, Jen. We receive the gift that you've been given. We receive it, and we thank you for it. God bless you. I just want to say thank you to everyone who helped bring the dance to the stage. When I'm at home, the art is personal, but when I come to the stage, the art is community. It's you watching this, but it's also the whole team behind the scenes that I'm so grateful for, and thank you for the body of Christ. You guys are amazing. Colossians... Chapter 4, verse 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We're three weeks into our study 
of Colossians. And as we've heard, this is Paul uh, writing a letter to the church in Colossae, a church that he would have, he didn't start, he didn't plant this church, and he would never get an opportunity to visit this church. And here he is, uh, he's locked up with his uh, ragtag group of guys that are locked up with him, both Jews and Gentiles. And he's writing to this community, uh, this, this church community, which as a number of them are starting to emerge around, they, they all share this marker of being a group of kind of misfits, uh, a group of people that don't necessarily belong together. Uh, rich and poor, Jews, Gentiles, men and women, all uh, focused around this kingdom ethic that's centered on selflessness and love that would be completely contrary to the, uh, the way of empire, which would be uh, motivated by fear and greed, uh, very self-serving. And in this letter, he, Paul sends this uh, time of deciphering these mysteries of Christ, this idea that we looked at last week of, of Christ being in us and us being in Christ. He challenges the traditional modes of authority that would be between men and women and children and their parents and even masters and slaves. It's a powerful teaching that he has. He's got this mind-blowing theology that, that says, if you want to really know and understand what God is like, if you really want to get a picture of who God is, look to Jesus. Jesus will give you the perfect picture of God's heart and what he's like. It's powerful teachings, packed completely to the brim with all kinds of good, juicy morsels, tasty nuggets. And he's coming to the end of his letter, and as he's wrapping up, one of the pieces that he gives to his people, the most practical piece of advice that he can give, he's talked about all of these, these lofty ideas and, and this fantastic theology, and he's building up, building up, and here he is now about to give these final instructions for his people. And what does he instruct his people to do? He says, devote yourselves to prayer. And for me, that, that, I'll have to admit, it feels a little bit anticlimactic. It feels like there should be, there should be more. There should be more that, that we're asked to do. Um, let's get busy doing something that seems like it's not enough. I know that I've had a number of challenges, as all of us have, over the past two years in, in moving into this pandemic, or living in this pandemic. I like the expression that we're all kind of in the same storm, but we're in different boats. So it's, all, it's kind of affected us all very differently. But for me, one of the challenges uh, has been, how do you care for people? I like to be in people's space, and, and if someone has a need, I like to be there and, and do everything that I can to serve and to help out. And in this season, especially early on, I couldn't do that. So as I'm finishing up in conversations with people or sending an email, I would say, sorry, I can't do anything. I can't really help, but I can pray. And when I would say those words in my heart, it would almost be like an apology. And not because I'm a good Canadian guy who just says sorry all the time and everything. Like, that's what we do. We just say sorry for, like, for whatever. But, the, but, I'm, but I actually felt apologetic that all I, I'm sorry, all I can do is pray. It's, it's a measly offering. And, and I'm a, I'm a, a pastor. Like, 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 we need to believe in these things. Like, the power of prayer is incredible, can move mountains. But here I am thinking so little of it, and I'm, I'm talking to people like it's just uh, lacks power. It's a disappointing feeling. And maybe it's because this whole sentiment of thoughts and prayers has started to feel cheap and almost meaningless. Like when there's a mass shooting or a natural disaster and you see it on your social media, you're scrolling through and someone says, uh, yeah, thoughts and prayers. And, and it, it almost feels like a throwaway line. It's almost dismissive and condescending to the real pain that's being experienced by people. 
Maybe the reason it's becoming offensive to say it is because it's, it's actually a way for us to ignore a situation as opposed to doing something about it, as opposed to taking any action. But our thoughts and our prayers should be an act of what we're willing to do and not an excuse for what we're not willing to do. But if we actually do take the time to pray for others and we lift them up to encourage them, I think we'll be amazed at what we see. We'll be amazed at the result of that. A really small example, but I think it's a powerful example still, is I can't count the amount of times where, where I've been going on with my day and someone will come to my mind. Has that ever happened to you? Where you're just sitting, and for no reason, you, maybe nothing's happened, no one said anything, but someone will just pop into your mind. And I wish I, I, wish I could say that I do it every time. I don't. But in the times I do, ah, maybe that person needs needs a word of encouragement or just a a little pick-me-up, a boost. Father, bless this person. Hope they're having a great day, that they would feel your presence. Amen. And keep it moving. And then sometimes I'll even uh, send a text message or an email to that person. Hey, I'm thinking about you in this moment. I hope you're well. God bless. Hit send. And the amount of times that that comes back to say, Quincy, you didn't realize what I was going through in that very moment or you, you, you were able to, to give me the little bit of encouragement that I needed right in that moment. See, if you spend any amount of time in church circles, you realize that we like to talk about prayer more than we actually do pray. Or we like to talk about God more than we actually talk to God. So I want to give us an opportunity to do that right now. Just a a few moments of silence. I just want us to, to think of a person. Somebody you know. They don't necessarily have to be going through a difficult time right now, but just think of that person right now. You have them in your mind? Can you see them? It's a reason that they've been brought to your imagination in this moment. So let's pray for them. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this person. I thank you for the the fact that you've brought them to mind in the way that you have. I'm grateful for them. And in this moment, I pray that they would experience peace and power. Thanks again for them, God. Amen. Simple. Now, if you have their their information, if you uh, have their email or their text, okay, yeah, now you can do it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, pull out your phone. This is not normal where you would pull out a phone in the church service. I hope my kids aren't here. I tell them all the time to keep their phones away. Get your phone out. Send a quick text message. Just say, thinking about you, praying for you. Peace. To pray is a sign of dependency. It's a sign of humility. To pray is to trust God that he sees us and that he hears us. When my nephew was born... He had all kinds of health issues, all kinds of health issues, and had some of the best doctors in the world caring for him and looking after him. And after a number of surgeries and and complications and things that looked hopeful and then not so hopeful, uh, the head doctor came uh, to our family and said, we don't expect him to survive the next three or four days, so you should make your arrangements. So in our minds, we had three or four days to do what? We prayed. Without a guarantee or assuredness that we would have an answer or that things would work out the way we wanted to, but we prayed. Some of us on our face, we prayed to God that he would take the situation. We realized we have so little control, so little control, 
in this world, in this life, but to just allow it to be in God's hands. And without a guarantee, without knowing what would come next, I'm, I'm pleased to say that this summer we get to celebrate his fourth birthday, which is something that we, we celebrate. But that's not, that's not the guarantee that that would work out in that way. But, but something happened in that meantime, in between time, of us coming together and trusting and putting all of everything, that, all of our cares on God. We're facing difficult times, very difficult times, as a nation, as a country, as a society, as a church family. And more difficult times are ahead of us, I believe. But what would happen if we, if we prayed for our church and really believed that something would happen? I'm reminded of that story in, uh, in Acts chapter 12 where Peter's released from prison. You know that one? Where the saints are praying for him to be released. They're praying for him to be released. And he gets released miraculously. He shows up at the door, knocks on the door. The servant girl comes and says, hey, Peter, it's you. And she runs back to say, hey, guess what? While they're praying, she interrupts their praying to say Peter's at the door. And they tell her she's crazy. <laughs> they, tell her, they tell her, what are you talking about? You're out of your mind. What would happen if, if, we, if we prayed and we actually believed that God could answer these prayers? Where our imagination can be sparked and it can be inspired. That it can actually connect us with the mind and the will of God. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says that we should set our minds on things above. Not to say that we become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good, but that by setting our minds in the direction of Jesus, even if our circumstances don't change or, secret, or, or they don't pan out in the way that we wish that they would, that somehow we would be changed in the process. Changed in the way that we love and we live. We're actually most awake when our eyes are closed that we're actually most awake when our eyes are closed. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. These words fall loosely from our lips. When chaos is outside our door or it beats its drum in our chest, we say, all we can do is pray. When you are confessing that the world has a hold on you today, when you are believing it more than you should, when it is especially dark and you can only make out the silhouettes of the hardest parts of being human, sometimes we are so human it hurts. And even our best words fail to help. But there is another lexicon that we can find, a dictionary where every word is a synonym for love, where prayer does not live only as a noun, but it becomes a verb. It is something to follow. Our thoughts and prayers are something to follow. Let our prayers claim us as descendants. Let us know their family tree when the world has tied our tongues with sadness, covered us in ourselves, told us to see people as other instead of our sisters or our brothers, when it has taken the word justice from our vocabulary, said that it is not worth something worth fighting for, when it makes dividing lines bigger than the Rocky Mountain Range, when all this human just knocks us to our knees, we will know that that is exactly where we need to be. Hands folded, book open. Our hearts may be full of break, but at the foot of the Father, and his son, with our eyes closed, that's when we are most awake. Paul has the opportunity to share with his people. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, but also pray for me. Now, Paul is locked up. This isn't the first time he's been in jail. 
and the stakes are as high as they possibly could be, where he would be witness to people being executed for their faith and for sharing the gospel. And, and Paul says, all right, pray for me. I know 100% if I were in Paul's position what I would be praying for. Get me out of here. Release. Escape. I need to get out. Some sort of miraculous um, jailbreak is what I would be praying for. And that wouldn't be too far off from Paul's imagination. He's seen these things happen in his life. Miraculous jailbreaks. I mentioned one already with Peter, how, how the angel came and just uh, blew open the doors and he had the, the holy escort right out, the, right out of the gates. And, and Paul would remember a time when he was, was locked up and around midnight, him and Silas just started singing worship songs and an earthquake comes and all of the doors fly open of the prison. But Paul, Paul's an interesting one because he doesn't do what I would do in that situation and run, <laughs> get out. But he stops and has a conversation with the, with the jailer. He stops and, and, and shares the, the good news of Jesus with him and invites him into relationship with Christ. And instead of a prison break, uh, a baptism breaks out <laughs> right there in the, in the prison. So Paul isn't looking for uh, an escape plan. He didn't see his time in prison locked up as a sign of defeat, but he saw it more as an opportunity to be able to partner in with what God was trying to do with him. So in the letter to the church in Colossae, he doesn't ask for any kind of escape, but he asks for opportunity. So I'm both, I'm baffled by this, but I'm also a little bit inspired by this, if I'm honest. Because so much of our life is focused on trying to avoid any kind of discomfort. I loved what our artist friend Amanda said last week when she was breaking down her piece. She said, Jesus is here to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. I love that and I hate it at the same time because I think of the times of my life or how much of my life is centered and built around comfort. What are the hard things that you're asking for release? The things maybe that we're praying for that God would give us an escape plan or break us out when there may possibly, there could possibly be an invitation to actually lean into that space, to risk being a little uncomfortable and see what God has in store for us. That we would see an opportunity instead of an escape. That we would see an opportunity instead of an escape. How to pray in five easy steps. One, remove the belief from your eyes that only sight can bring clarity. Take the miraculous into account. The heart has been known to draw far better pictures than our mind could ever fathom. Like the way a heart is also a cross. Like a father who gave his only son. Two, touch your heart with your hand. And now bow deeply, but in here. It's like kneeling to touch something delicate or laying your body full length prostrate to make the path to Santiago. Three, let your hands meet in connection this way, but also this way, because this commute is the shortest distance you will ever travel. Four, notice your feet. What are they planted on? Where are they take or, taking you? Are you numbering your steps or are you running to get somewhere? Be sure to consult your map. Five, fold your mind into the shape of open, like a palm up flame ready for the burn of assignment. It is, a, it is not a where will you take me or what will you give me 
It is a, who will you send me for? That question is never a mistake. The way to pray is always for opportunity, but never for escape. Let's pray. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Wow. Amen. Thank you, Quincy and Dagmar and Jen. Um, what a gift. What a gift this series is. Thank you for sharing your gift with us. We've received that, as Quincy said at the beginning. I feel like, um, I, I feel like there was so much there, so much to uh, contemplate, so much to wrestle with, uh, so challenging, right? This idea of thoughts and prayers. How do we, um, how do we pray? Well, two things come to mind in, as I think about that. First of all, and we've mentioned this already, but home church, right? If you want a place to um, be family with together, to pray together, to do life together, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash home church and find a home church nearest you. Uh, we've got home churches that are meeting in person. We've got home churches that meet online, everything in between. So please do. Today is the day. Uh, to join a home church. And then secondly, we've got our month of prayer coming up, which is an opportunity to pray together both um, through words, but also through tangible expressions. And if you want uh, to join with us as we pray, go to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer to get information in how to join as we pray leading up on the road to hope towards Easter. Hey, it has been a really, really um, incredible time together. Thank you for joining us um, yeah, I hope you have an incredible week. Go experience God and his peace as you go this week. We'll see you next time. Take care.